Good morning, everybody. Today's message is on the sower, the parable of the sower. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 3. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jesus goes on to say, whoever hears these words is blessed. And then he explains the parable. Listen to then, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Father, please guide us today so that your word, your seed, penetrate our hearts and transform us. In Jesus' name we pray. subject and this week uh, one of the scholars I came across was Tim Keller and he has some great insights and some great illustrations so I want to give him credit for a lot of this. So I'd like to start by simply saying that a lot of Christians believe that the main thing about Christianity is that 
Christ died for our sins, took them all upon himself, uh, took them to the grave, forgave us of our sins, cleansed us of all unrighteousness. And because of that, we, through Jesus, are able to have eternal life, are able to enter into heaven, and then ultimately the new creation. Now, that is true. And if that's all that we ever got out of Christianity, that's more than we deserve, that's more better than we can imagine, it's great. But Christianity is so much larger than that. Its vision is so much bigger. It's about what Jesus called the kingdom of God. In Matthew, he called it the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, like we see in Isaiah chapter 55, there's a verse there that says, oh, God rains down his rains. He brings the snow that waters the earth. The earth sprouts flowers and the flowers spread their seeds. And the seeds uh, landing in the ground are like the word of God. The word of God penetrates the earth. It changes it. And the word of God will not come back void. In other words, it's the word of God that will transform the world. And here Jesus tells a parable about seeds, and the seeds are the word of God. And so, the sower uh, sows all these seeds, and he throws them on good soil, and he throws them on hard soil, and rocky soil, and, and soil with thir thorns. And I was a landscaper uh, in the summers for my dad for many years. And I have to tell you, if I were sowing seed after having prepared the soil, my father would say, and I threw the seed off on the sidewalk and rocks and everything, he would say, what are you doing? You are wasting the seeds on this bad soil. And, uh, but, and of course, that makes sense, but not the sower here. The sower is willing to sow his seed, sow his word anywhere. Because God is the ultimate optimist, and he's even careless with his word. In other words, there's not a place on earth that God does not care about, come to, and believe that that seed can sprout. So that's the first thing to observe. The second thing to ask is, how does the kingdom of God come? Well, Jesus said it. The kingdom of God comes by hearing. Those who hear the word of God are blessed. And so, the seed takes root in people who hear, who listen, who receive, who are receptive, who allow the word of God, the seed, to penetrate them. And as it penetrates them, it takes root and it begins to transform and changes from the inside out. And that's how the kingdom of God comes, by being taking heed and being careful to respond to that word at work within us. Now, this is very unusual because the way kingdoms on planet Earth come about, we all know this, is through power, through coercion, through manipulation, through people who are demagogues and take their power and use it to, to, uh, to, to change, to, to convince the sheep out there to follow them. And then they gain power around them and just look at the world. Look to Russia or China or Myanmar or Thailand or a number of the uh, nations in the African continent and Latin America and in Indonesia. That's how kingdoms on earth work through power. And the leaders are typically great at getting a hearing, but not very good at giving a hearing. Typically great at talking, but not very good at listening. Typically great at manipulating and using sound bites and words and manipulations to get what they want 
but not very good at stopping, receiving, meditating, taking in what God has given them. Let it take them over and then respond. Uh, two different ways to bring about a kingdom. And so Jesus is saying the way the kingdom of God grows is from the bottom up. It changes a field when one seed lands in a fertilized seed a field, we could say. What it does is it gets under the surface. And if it re reproduces vegetatively, it can transform the entire field with one seed. Coercion is like a boulder which lands on the field, just falls in a great thud. It will change the configuration of the surface of that field, and it just stays there. But it doesn't influence the rest of the field. The seed penetrates, comes underneath, and even as its root system penetrates the entire field, it not only does its penetration and springing up, it even transforms the composition of the soil itself. And so, because of this, because of this giant difference between the kingdoms of this earth and the kingdom of God, we can look to John the Baptist, who, when he was arrested, was thrown in prison, and we know that his life ended with his a beheading. Terrible. But he was a Jew, and every Jew expected from their understanding of the Old Testament that the kingdom of God would come in power, would come through force, would come in a way that the troops would be rallied, drive out the Romans, and Israel would be reestablished to its former glory. So John, while he was in prison, he asked the question, is this is Jesus is Jesus the one? Because he had no concept of the kingdom of God coming the way of a seed. His answer was the the answer was given to him: um, the blind see, and the lame walk, and the sick are healed, and that's the power of God. But that was a, a, a paradigm shift for John, and so. The way the kingdom of God works is from the bottom up. It's underwhelming. It's not obvious. And if we get honest with the Christian story, it's a crazy story. The creator of the universe, the most powerful force individual who ever lived, enters this world with the power of heaven as a human being. As a seed, says the only parable in the Gospel of John, which dies. And so he comes in, he claims to be king, rides into Jerusalem as a king, and goes right to his adversary, the uh, false kingdom of this world, and allows Rome and Satan himself to destroy him, crucify him, and bury him. Now that's crazy. What kind of a king wins his battle by dying to the enemy? That's the kingdom of God. And because of that, Christians have always been taught, we all know this if you're a believer, that the way to gain power is to lose power. The way to get up in the world is to go down the ladder. The way to... Um, live your life, to gain life, is to lose your life. The way through to growth, Christian growth, growing into the image of Christ, is not getting rid of suffering, it's going through suffering. And so, Christians know that, whether we do it or not, that's the teaching. That's the kingdom of God. All coercive kingdoms on planet Earth will one day be in the dustbin of history. But God's kingdom 
that kingdom will eventually change everything on planet Earth. It is so powerful that Christianity claims, and Christianity claims nothing less than this, that every disease will be healed, every brokenness will be reconciled, every sin will be uh, forgiven, and righteousness will reign. Every bit of poverty, economic problems, cruelty, um, national clashes, all of it is going to be removed so that one day there will not only be peace on earth, but there will be purpose on earth, and there will be people growing in the consummate freedom of perfected obedience, obedience being perfected forever and ever with a great God. That's the power of Christianity, and it teaches nothing less. And Jesus is saying, hear me on this. The way it comes is through hearing, listening, receiving. Now, he gives three warnings uh, to us. Yes, the seed comes. Yes, the word of God comes, and no one, no one is without having had that seed come to him or her. No one. Yet, some people are like the path. The path is really hard. And it symbolizes a hard heart. It's so easy, I think, for a lot of people, even Christians do this, to keep God, to keep that which could change them at arm's length. And what we do so easily is we rationalize, intellectualize, um, be theoretical or theological. In other words, we can talk about that thing out there, about God, but it never gets into our hearts because they're hard. Uh, it's these people who maybe have never had that deep experience that says, wow, this book, this Bible, this Christian message, it's got my name written all over it. This is about me. Oh, I see myself in the mirror. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Or um, just having had that feeling that, wow, I matter to God. There is a God, and I matter to Him. That's the penetration. For me, one of the things I've thought for years is all the places in this world are, indeed, as C.S. Lewis put it, kind of the shadow lands, and I feel like Peter... You know, where else am I going to go other than to the one who has the words of eternal life? The second person comes out of the rocky soil. This is the person where the seed does take root and it begins to grow. But when the sun comes out and it begins to scorch, it begins to fade. And when this person feels the heat, can't take the heat and sort of abandons Christianity because... Um, this person did not come to the point where his or her suffering was reduced. Didn't come to the point where his or her life, in his or her view, became better. Um, ran into hardships, and the suffering was too much, and what they lost in the heat, it turns out, was maybe their idols. Maybe they're true God. Maybe that thing that they were saying, God, do this for me, was the thing that they really wanted and not God himself. They didn't realize that what they really needed was to recognize that they were a sinner in need of a, sa in need of a Savior. Now, the way Jesus tells this parable is that the first two fell away, so we guess they're not Christians. But the third uh, soil has thorns. This seed does take root. This seed does grow. And this is the divided heart. This is the Christian. This is the person. This is the person who uh, loves God, but also loves some other thing that's uh, got their heart. It's a divided heart. A divided heart trying to go here, trying to go here. And maybe the division has to do with the big three. 
Money, sex, and power. Maybe you, if that's you, are using your money in a way that doesn't honor God. Maybe you are using your sexuality in a way that just um, is wrong. Or maybe you are using your power, manipulating in some way that isn't just uh, letting your yes be yes and your no be no. It's like a person with one foot in one boat and you're on a lake and the two boats are beside each other and your other foot is in the other boat and you're trying so hard to keep your balance and you can't do it because the boats sort of pull in each direction and you're spending all your energy trying to do this and that's why so many Christians are not only unfruitful as Jesus says but are miserable, are anxious, are worried, are frustrated. It's because all their, all they have not given themselves over a body, mind, soul, spirit to one God. They're divided. And so that leaves each of us thinking. Jesus always gets us thinking, thinking about um, who am I, or. Could it be that I'm that third person? I'm sold out and there's fruitfulness in my life. But I want to end this with good news. The, the gospel always, always, always has good news. If you think that you have something going on in you that's a hard heart or something, some rocks that keep the roots shallow or that you've got a divided heart, here's the good news. Soil cannot make itself supple and uh, prepared for the seeds. Can't do it. Soil cannot eject rocks from itself. Soil cannot, by itself, get rid of the thorns. Can't do it. Impossible. But the gardener can remove the rocks. The gardener can till the soil. The gardener, the sower, the farmer can get rid of the thorns. So what does the soil do? What do you do? If there's something between you and God getting in the way of your fruitfulness, just ask. A friend of mine told me that 30, 35 years ago. Just ask. And when you ask, God is going to give you the answer, you know, I've been waiting for you to ask me. Because he will then say, uh, yes, those thorns, I took them on my scalp. Those rocks, I was buried in rocks. That I have taken care of and will take care of. Now, what's it take? What's the point of the parable? It, the kingdom of God comes to you, comes to everybody by hearing. So what do you do? Hear, receive, meditate, read, ponder, read slowly, take it in, take heed to what you read here. Just take it in big chunks, take it in little chunks, chew on the word and allow it to transform you from the inside out and as the roots grow and you feel yourself getting a different perspective on things and you're a little bit surprised and then at that point begin to act on what you are being shown. The sower sows seeds and those seeds bring the kingdom of God on earth and that brings, brings the kingdom of God in you by hearing. God bless everybody. Let's continue to work.
unto him who is able to do exceedingly more than all that we can hope or imagine, according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. Keep in mind, everybody, that we have our annual general meeting in two weeks. If it's impossible for you to be there, turn in your absentee ballot before then to me or to Sandra, but plan to stay after worship so that we can have our meeting and learn about what happened in 2020. Also, women's Bible study, uh, Tuesday night, parable Bible study, Wednesday night, and a men's Bible study starting soon. God bless everybody. Bye-bye.